All right, welcome back. Hope we're all having a great week. Today we're continuing our RBT exam practice question series where we're going through some RBT practice questions and breaking them down together. If you're looking for our study materials, please check out rbtexamreview.com. Links to the products are in the comments below. We offer three practice exams, a full task list study guide. Our combo pack comes with everything. It's our best deal. And we also have a competency study guide as well. Congratulations to everyone who recently passed their exam. Please let us know when you do pass so we can give you a shout out. We are now doing shout outs every other Friday. So leave a comment below when you pass so we can include you in those questions, comments. Please let me know. I would love to help work hard, study hard. Let's get to the questions. Question one, which of the following types of measurements includes the SD in the measurement? All right. Should be a pretty easy question if you know your terms and definitions. And this has become up, been coming up a lot lately as we talk with RBTs looking to pass their exam. They all ask, what's the most important thing to know to pass my exam? The number one thing, the most important thing you need to know is fluency. Okay, and what I mean by that is fluency of terms and definitions. If you know that, the test becomes significantly easier. Because if you look at this type of question, which is asking about measurement and using the SD in the measurement, well, think in your head, what type of measurement do we use where we're actually using the SD to take the data? Frequency. Frequency, what are we doing? Frequency, we're counting, right? We're just counting responses. We're not necessarily worried about the SD. We're just looking at the response and counting it as it happens. Duration, we're looking from the start of the response to the end of the response and taking that total time. Again, not really concerned with the SD. Into response time, so be careful. Into response time is what? It's the time in between responses. So response one to response two, two to three, three to four, so on and so forth. Again, not really concerned with the SD, really just concerned with the response. So if we look at D latency, what is latency? Well, think about it. It is the time in between the SD and the first response. When using latency measurement, we are directly including the SD in our data analysis, right? Or our data collection. We need to know the SD in order to collect latency data. Frequency, duration, IRT, you don't necessarily need to know anything except for what the response looks like. Except latency, you do, right? We have to know the SD. We have to know how the response looks in order to measure it. So which of the following types of measurements includes the SD? That would be D, latency. Assume that we have multiple items labeled A, B, C, D, and E. If we conducted a multiple stimulus preference assessment with replacement, how might that look? Don't be overwhelmed. At first glance, this can look like a very overwhelming question. First things first, let's slow down and let's think about what the question wants to know. The question is asking about a multiple stimulus preference assessment with replacement. So let's define that. What are we doing here? Well, we're going to take an array of three or more items, present them to a client. When the client picks it, we are going to put that item back and replace the other items because it's preferences, multiple preference assessment with replacement. So if we have our five items, A, B, C, D, and E, we know whatever item the, the client picks, A, B, C, D, or E, we're going to replace that item and then change out the other four. So that's kind of what we're looking for. So A, if the client chose C out of the first array, our next array would be A, B, D, and E. Well, what's the issue here? Well, we're looking at a with replacement assessment. Here, we're taking away that was the one that was chosen, which was C. So that's going to be a multiple stimulus assessment without replacement, not what we're looking for. B, if the client chose C out of the first array, our next array would be A, B, D, F, and E. What's the issue here? Well, with a with replacement strategy, whatever item that is chosen is put back. We can see C was chosen, but it wasn't put back. So we can eliminate B. C, if the client chose C out of the first array, our next array would be F, G, C, M, N. All right, this looks pretty good. C was chosen, it was put back. The other four were what? Were replaced. Hence, multiple stimulus assessment with replacement. C looks perfect. Always read all of your answer choices. So D, if the client chose C out of the first array, our next array would be F, G, K, M, and N. Same issue as B and A. C is not replaced. The only answer here 
that actually replaces C, the one that was chosen, is C. So our answer choice is C. Don't get overwhelmed by some of the questions, right? If they're long or they have a lot of different variables to it, slow down. Understand what the question is asking. Define any relevant terms and proceed from there, okay? So our answer here is C. If you were planning to use errorless teaching, what type of prompt would typically be most effective at first? Stop. Let's break down the question. Shorter questions, the tendency is to read the question quickly and then jump straight to the answer choices. Now, if you understand the question, that's one thing, but most people usually read the question once or twice. Instead of doing that, let's just break down the relevant parts, right? Let's look at the terms we need to know. The question is asking about errorless teaching. And in errorless teaching, what are we doing? It's exactly what it sounds like. Don't overcomplicate it. We're preventing errors from happening. We're teaching by preventing errors from happening. That is errorless learning. So if we want to use the prompt that would typically be most effective at first, what are we going to use to prevent errors from happening? This would typically is important, right? Because not everything is really 100% of the time, right? It depends on the client, et cetera. But what they're asking for is the best answer and the most typical answer. So the most typical way to prevent errors would be what? Well, A, partial physical would be pretty good, right? We're going to partially phys physically prompt the client. But there's still a chance an error can occur, right? Because I'm not actually hand over handing them. I'm just lightly touching them or whatever a partial physical might look like. If we look at B, however, a full physical, that would typically be the most effective. Why? Well, if I am fully physically prompting you hand over hand, how are you going to make an error, right? I'm essentially, when I do a full physical prompt, doing the task for you. So if I want to use errorless teaching and I want the prompt that's going to be most effective at first, typically, it's always going to be full physical, right? And then we look at modeling and gestural. Both are fine, right? Modeling is more intrusive than gestural, and gestural is a fine prompt. However, can you make a mistake after being gestured to? Absolutely. What about having a model? Can you make a mistake following a model? Certainly. Partial physical? Yes, sure. Full physical, you have the least opportunity or the least chances to make a mistake because hand over hand, the person providing the full physical prompt is essentially doing the task for you. So if you're using planning to use errorless teaching and you want the prompt that is most likely going to be effective, you're probably going to start with B, full physical. Ted engages in attention-seeking behavior when his parents help his sister get dressed. If Ted started screaming yesterday, as soon as his parents started putting on his sister's shirt, Ted's screaming would be considered a what? A couple of different things at play here. If you've been studying, hopefully a couple of thoughts popped into your mind while reading this question. First things first, Ted engages in attention-seeking behavior when his parents help his sister get dressed. So that's what? It's our function, right? Attention is the function. Now we know Ted started screaming yesterday as soon as his parents started putting on his sister's shirt. So Ted is doing what? Well, Ted is screaming in response to his parents putting on the shirt. The antecedent is his parents putting on his shirt, right? So Ted screaming is considered a what? If his parents putting on the shirt is the antecedent, what follows the antecedent? Is it a response class? Well, a response class is made up of more than one, res one response, and we're only, really only looking at a singular response here, right? Ted screaming. Ted screaming is not a stimulus, right, or a stimuli. It's, it's a response. Response and stimulus are different things. A consequence. Well, it's not a consequence, okay? It was in reaction, right, to his parents putting on a sister's shirt, which was the antecedent. Okay, it's not the consequence for that. It's the reaction to it. So it's going to be a response, right? Pretty simple. Ted screaming is a response. Antecedent, parents putting on a sister's shirt. <clears throat> um, their behavior or the response, if we're looking at ABC, would be Ted screaming. And then we'll have a consequence, however his parents reacted. But Ted screaming would be considered a response in reaction to the antecedent of parents putting on his sister's shirt. Pretty straightforward question. The very first step in a skill acquisition plan is what? Don't overthink these type of questions. If they ask you about steps in a skill acquisition plan or steps in a behavior plan, let's not overthink it. Just consider what might a skill acquisition plan consist of? Well, first and foremost, we need a, a behavior, right? Or a skill we're going to teach. We need a goal. We need data. And we need to analyze the data, right? 
And then, of course, we're going to have our intervention plans, but that's essentially what a plan boils down to. So that being said, what is our first step in that going to be? Is it going to be choosing a target behavior, setting a goal, collecting baseline data, or analyzing data and making changes? Well, clearly, the first thing we're doing is not analyzing data and making changes because we don't have anything to take data on or make changes for yet, right? Same thing with collecting baseline data. To collect baseline data, we need a target behavior. So it leaves us with choosing a target behavior and setting a behavioral goal. Well, would you rather set a goal knowing your target behavior or pick a target behavior knowing your goal? Well, you're going to be a lot better off picking a behavior first and then setting a goal, right? So the first step in a skill acquisition plan and even a behavior plan is picking a target behavior or target skill. We need to know what we're targeting. What are we trying to change? What are we working with? The first step in a skill acquisition plan is A, choosing a target behavior. You're excited that your son is now old enough to stay at home by himself. Your son likes to cook his own meals, but will sometimes forget to turn the oven off. What intervention would be best to target this behavior? A couple of things in play here. One, safety issue, right? Your son can stay at home by himself, but he likes to cook, and sometimes he doesn't turn the oven off. It's fire hazard. So we need to address this pretty quickly, right? We also want to eliminate this from his repertoire. We don't want him turning the oven off 80% of the time. We want him turning it off 100% of the time. This is a matter of safety. So you have to consider that when picking interventions, right? Now, if you look at our answer choices, we have three differential reinforcements possibilities and a discrimination possibility. Remember, discrimination deals with what? Discrimination deals with stimuli. Differentiation deals with responses. Here we're dealing with responses, right? We're not dealing with discrimination. We're not teaching him to distinguish between two or more stimuli. We need a different response, okay? So we can eliminate A. Then we have DRA, DRI, and DRL. And DRL, you don't necessarily need to know, but we're trying to lower the rate of behavior, but not necessarily eliminate it. We need to get rid of this, right? We need to get rid of him not turning the oven off. So now we have DRA and DRI, which are very similar, almost identical, actually, except for one thing. What's the one thing different? Well, in DRI, the replacement behavior cannot happen at the same time as the target behavior. In DRA, it can. So if we want to target the safety skill, do we want to teach a replacement behavior that can happen at the same time as the forgetting to turn the oven off? No, we want something completely unrelated, not topographically similar, okay? The best intervention to use, or at least try it first, is going to be a DRI, because this is the one that's targeting a replacement behavior where the sun is not going to be able to forget to turn the oven off, all right? Don't worry about how that looks. That's not what the question is asking. It's not what the test is asking, okay? Just answer what the test is asking. And the test wants to know, you've got a safety skill. You need a replacement behavior. What are we going to use? Well, DRO is not an option, right? So we're not going to quickly reduce it. Next best thing is going to be DRA because we're teaching a replacement behavior that can happen at the same time as him forgetting to turn the oven off. So our answer is C, DRI. A student starts to run away from his kindergarten classroom when it is time to do handwriting. His teacher implements a response cost procedure in response to this new behavior. What might the response cost procedure look like? It's actually a very easy question if we know our definitions. That's why fluency is so important. What are we going to do first? Well, let's define response cost. That's exactly what, that's the entire question, right? What is response cost? And response cost is removal of a stimulus or a reinforcer in response to a maladaptive or unwanted behavior. Simple as that. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for an answer that describes that. If our behavior is running away from the classroom when it's time to do handwriting, we know a response cost will be removing something in response to him running away. So that's our prediction. Pretty straightforward, right? A, each time a student completes handwriting, they will earn a star. Response cost, are we giving them something? Are we, are we providing them something? No, we're taking something away, okay? A, would look more like a reinforcement procedure. B, each time the student attempts to run away, the teacher will yell at them. Is the teacher taking anything away? No, we're adding something, right? Response cost is negative punishment. We're taking away. Teacher adding 
Yelling is positive punishment or an attempt to be positive punishment, but it is not a response cost. C, each time the student attempts to run away, they will lose a star. Here we go. Now we're taking away the star in response in an attempt to reduce running away. That is response cost to me. C looks pretty good. Let's read D. Each time the student attempts to run away, they will be sent to the principal's office. All right. Now we're one, allowing escape. Two, not necessarily taking anything away. We're just sending them off to a different environment, sending them to the principal's office. That is not response cost. Response cost is C. You do something, I take something away. Token, star, whatever it might be. So what might the response cost procedure look like? In reaction, each time a student attempts to run away, they will lose a star. C. Automatic behavior as it relates to the four functions of behavior could also be described as what? Okay, automatic behavior is a little tricky because the way it's taught now, a lot of people are taught that automatic behavior is, is sensory. And they are interchangeable, right? Automatic sensory is a function of behavior. But we need to know what automatic behavior, what, what it truly means. Why, why do we have automatic behavior as a function? Okay, well, if we think of our three other functions, escape, tangible attention, those are all socially related, right? Those three things need a social component. Automatic just means alone. You don't need a social component. It happens for one person without anybody else's help. So this question wants to know automatic behavior could also be described as what? A behavior that happens when someone is alone. Certainly. If this behavior is happening when no one is around, that is automatic behavior. Automatic means alone. B, behavior that happens to gain attention. No, attention is a separate function from automatic. C, behavior that happens to get out of a task demand. No, escape is a separate function in automatic. And then D, behavior that is socially mediated. No, behavior that is socially mediated is the opposite of automatic behavior, which is behavior that can happen when someone is alone, behavior that doesn't need any social help. So automatic behavior could also be described as A, behavior that happens when someone is alone. And then finally, behavior that occurs outside of the learned environment is considered blank, while behavior that occurs after some or all teaching has stopped is considered blank. I just did a brand new video on these concepts. Please go check that out. What do we know? We know that behavior that occurs outside of the learned environment is what? We're generalizing, right? We have our learned environment. We want that behavior to occur away from the learning environment. When it does, it's generalized. And then behavior that occurs after some of all teaching has stopped is considered what? Well, behavior that is persistent once we stop teaching it is what? Maintenance, right? So that's what we're looking for. Behavior that occurs outside of the learning environment is considered generalized. Behavior that occurs after some or all teaching has stopped is considered maintained. A, maintained, generalized. Not what we're looking for. Behavior that occurs outside of the learned environment is considered maintained. Mm, not necessarily, right? Um, it really depends because if we're still teaching it, right, it's not necessarily maintained. However, B, behavior that occurs outside of the learned environment is considered generalized, yes, while behavior that occurs after some or all teaching is stopped is considered maintained, yes. C and D both have prompted, which is incorrect. Our answer is going to be B, generalized, maintained. Thank you for watching. Please check out rbtexamreview.com for all of our study materials. Continue to work hard and study hard questions, keep them coming. Let us know when you pass. I'll see you soon.